Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first session of the 2022 Beginners Quilting Bee by Long Army by Jacqueline. If you are in the live session, unfortunately, you will notice that um, you are not in the recording because somebody forgot to hit record. So anyways, onwards and upwards, we're going to go ahead and um, proceed. And go ahead and do the recording over, just a quick run through of the original presentation. And it won't have all the fun interactive, everybody being on there and introducing themselves, but I promise next week I'll remember to hit record. So welcome to the Beginner Quilting Bee by Long Arming by Jacqueline for 2022. Um, today's session is just the kickoff and supply list, so we'll do introductions. I'm Jacqueline Massey from Long Arming by Jacqueline. I've been quilting for about 20 um, years, give or take, and um, we do long arming here at the studio and make custom quilts for people, and we also do instructions, so welcome. Um, and we've got a nice assortment of quilters joining us live for the um, live online class session and for those of you who are joining later by the recording and sewing at your own pace we welcome you as well um so thanks for joining let's move on oh finished is better than perfect let's discuss jenny doan for those of you who don't know is one of the world's most famous quilters she started a quilting business and it's now known worldwide as the disneyland of quilting and she's an amazing person and she's famous for this quote, finished is better than perfect. Quilting is a endurance sport. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, your goal is not to nitpick yourself and be critical of yourself for this um, project. It's to get through and get finished. And this is a very forgiving pattern and it is going to be beautiful when you're done. And it's a labor of love and it's, very forgiving and it's going to be wonderful. So take it easy on yourself. You're here to learn. You're here to enjoy the process. You're here to learn some new skills and it will be a beautiful and creative expression of you and wonderful when it's done. So don't stress out. This is a very no stress um, goings on. So this year's beginner quilting project is a log cabin Missouri star. So the whole quilt has that star. This one is our kit in the black and white colorway and you can get that light background with a dark star on it like you see here and this is shown with the yellow accent color in the centers of your dots and um, you can also reverse that and get that done with a dark background and a white star and the accent color comes in hot pink royal blue lime green or the sunny yellow that you see in the drawing so that's the kit and this is the quilt that we're making you do not need to purchase the kit to participate in the b and learn the skills you are welcome to go out and buy pre-cuts you can buy yardage if you have fabric around the house you can have fabric around the house um, and use that you can harvest from your scraps or old sheets or clothing or whatever you want to do so um, this is a free class and it can be free if you have access to the materials to do it, or you can also purchase them from us if you wanna support the channel. Um, so what makes this special and a little more interesting, you could just take a big square of fabric, sew two triangles together and get that sort of triangle shape. But what makes this fun and interesting is that we've gone ahead and made a log cabin block. And that's going to add a lot of texture and interest and that custom look to your quilt. That's going to make it unique. Even if someone else buys the exact same kit in the exact same colorway, the rate, the way they arrange those strips together is going to be different. So your quilt is going to be a unique fingerprint to you, even if you buy the same kit in the same colorway as someone else. So no two are gonna be alike. And it's um, combining the strips like this that makes it interesting. I love teaching the log cabin because it's a really flexible and versatile block. 
And all you need to know is it is center out construction. If you know that, the rest of the rules are suggestions. So the center out construction is what makes it a log cabin. And then the sky's the limit after that. You can change up and vary on a theme, anything, and um, use this block to create so many different quilts, so many different looks, so many different blocks. So it's that center out construction. Pause over, you're done. Um, so we're doing for this project, the classic sort of traditional format of the block where it forms a half square triangle. So if you look at the block, you've got this strong diagonal where you've got your square and it looks like two triangles have come together and you've got contrasting groups of colors. So in this example and the examples for the, the rest of the tutorial, you, I'm using sort of a creamy yellow and a dark blue as my two color groups. So those aren't all in fabric. Those would be multiple fabrics that are sort of in that group. And you want your eyes to perceive a strong contrast between those groups. And traditionally, this block has that red center dot, the center square that it spirals around. And that traditionally represented the hearth. So you'd have your cabin in the dark cold woods, and the red square would represent your warm hearth in the center of your cabin. So if you put this out, you were welcoming someone into the warm hearth at the center of your cabin. So it was very much a, a sign of love and warmth and inviting um, someone to come to your hearth. Um, so this layout is doing kind of a light, dark contrast. And I might use the terms light and dark. I might use the terms background and star. But your colorway, it might be black and white. You could do a Christmas quilt in green and red. You could do a Valentine's Day quilt with kind of um, dark pinks and red for one. And then mostly whites with little hit, hints of pink for the other group. And that would make it a Valentine's quilt. So this can really look like anything you want it to look like. Even the black and white colorway of the kit, you put hot pink in there, it's super cute for kids. It's kind of fun and pops. If you put a gold accent in there, that would be a very elegant home decor throw that would be at home in um, a very upscale home. So it can be very elegant, it can be very playful. It's really up to what you want to do. Um, and what I love about this block, once you've done the half square triangle look. So the strong contrasting, you're grouping your fabrics on that strong diagonal. Now, when you combine those blocks into a pattern for the overall quilt, and we'll see this on the next slide, you can make all kinds of cool quilts. So by teaching you this one block, I'm actually teaching you thousands of different blocks that you can vary off this theme. And by teaching you this one block, I'm teaching you thousands of quilts that you can play around with and create just by turning those triangles around to create different patterns when you assemble them. So once you get the basics, the sky is really the limit. And I don't like to waste your time teaching you something that's, okay, I can do this one thing and that's over. You're gonna build some skills here. You can make thousands of different quilts with what you learn here and never have to look the same. So here's the center out construction. You start with your, I'm gonna say red, because in this drawing it's red, your center accent block. And for us, that's gonna be a two and a half inch square. And then, so it's A. And then you'll come over to B, you'll sew a strip on one side. And then you'll find a strip long enough for C. And you'll sew a strip and you'll go around, you'll sew on D, you'll go around, you'll sew on E. And you're just spiraling around that center square and you just keep making laps so in our quilt that we're making our design we're going to make the center and then three complete laps all the way around that center for the design that we're doing for the quilt pattern that we're doing you just go around and around keep making laps until you're happy so for our quilt all of our strip width is two and a half we're going to have two strong contrasting color groups and then the accent color in the center, giving that traditional sort of strong diagonal. You don't have to use, once you make our quilt, 
and you're making your own quilts in the future and doing this over and over again, um, you don't have to use the same width of strips. You don't have to group the colors in the strong diagonal. If you don't like that, you can make it more scrappy and wild. Um, you can make it more improvisational. So what I call scrap quilting is true scrap quilting. So I have fabric that is left over from old clothing that's harvested from sheep fats, that is left over from other projects um, that I inherited. So I literally just have bits and pieces of fabric and I just combine pieces of fabric that are from all different sources, just whatever I can get my hands on. And that's really the real meaning of scrappy, old school scrappy, because quilting was thriftiness and economy. People would buy bolts of fabric and they would load up their horse and wagon and go to town and go to the mercantile and buy yardage. And there would probably be white and maybe one, two, four colors, not a lot of variety. So they did a whole bolt, blue, or red or whatever. And they would come home and they would do the big things that need big pieces of fabric first, like curtains, dresses, clothing. Everybody's dress would be the same color because you had a bolt of blue and everybody got a blue dress. And then it would sort of waterfall down from there. So whatever bits and bobs that you cut off to make the dress or the curtains or whatever, you would hold onto those and incorporate that into your quilt. So they're literally scraps. And then your children grow out of the clothes or they wear out the clothes. It gets a stain. It gets a hole. You would cut out the good usable fabric that was left from those clothes. And that might be small little bitty pieces that you're salvaging and trying to, you may do or did without. So you are going to get every bit of use and value out of that fabric because if you didn't use it, you didn't have it. Um, so they would take those little bits and pieces and combine them. And it was whatever you have whatever you could get your hands on. Um, and then it would sort of waterfall and cascade from there. So you made your curtains and your dresses and you took your scraps from that or you salvaged the old pieces from um, clothes that were given out or whatever. And those would go into your quilts. And then once they were in your quilt and the quilt started to wear out, you would either take that old quilt and place it inside and use it as the stuffing or the batting of a new quilt, or they would be cut up and used as rags and scrub cloths. So everything was used until it literally just dissolved into thread and was lint and was gone. So all that to say, originally scrappy meant any bit of fabric you could get your hands on. And these days they use sc scrappy to say no sort of fussy planned color layout. Um, and usually what they mean is you're using, like a lot of times it'll be pre-cuts and you've got 42 pieces of fabric and they're all from a curated collection of fabrics that are designed to go together and the colors meld together and the designs all look similar. So you're not being fussy about where you're putting the colors, but it's not really scrappy. You're buying a collection of fabrics that were meant to go together and they're beautiful, um, but they're just not a planned colorway. When I say scrappy, I mean the old school for real. I'm going to cut pieces out of jeans and sweaters and sheets and towels and make stuff out of that. Okay. So let's talk fabric needs. This is your layout. And you can see we've got some of the blocks have that strong, um, bold contrast. And you pick your own colorway. Ours for the kits is blacks and whites. And you can have black for the background or white for the background. And then the other one would be the star. Um, in our previous classes, we have had a young lady do darks and lights, kind of navies and more like whites, lighter prints to make um, her star and her contrast. And then we had another young lady, she did very similar to this colorway. Her yellows are brighter and sunnier. Her accent color was a nice, cute, hot pink center, and then kind of the navies in the back. So we've had some really cute colorways, but the colors that you pick will make this quilt look totally different from your neighbor's quilt. So um, pick what you like. Your eyeball should perceive two clear groups. You don't have to use the rules for separating the groups that I use, but you have to come up with a rule. Are you going warm colors, cool colors? 
All right, you go in, maybe your school colors are black and gold and you've got kind of blacks and kind of gold. So your prints will be mostly black and mostly gold to give your eye the general impression that you've got two color groups. Your eye should see the rule. Whatever rule you want, you use it, you figure it out, you stick to it, but your, your eyeball should see two clear groups in those fabrics. And then for the tiny dot in the center, each of those is a two and a half inch square. You'll need an accent color that pops. So traditionally old school, those were red because it represented a fireplace, um, but that could be any color you want. It should look like it belongs on the same quilt, but also pop and have a little bit of contrast. So you, you see that color and it stands out. Um, if you do not want to fool around with cutting a whole bunch of two and a half inch strips, you can do a jelly roll, but you will need an additional half yard of fabric and cut into strips. So it's a lot less cutting. That's about um, 12 or 14 strips somewhere in there, the additional half yard. So around 52 two and a half inch strips and WOF, that's width of fabric. Most fabric that you buy off the bolt is 42 to 45 inches. It varies from bolt to bolt. Um, you can find that information on the label, but 42 to 45 is about the normal range for typical like quilting cottons will come in at. Most fabrics come off the bolt in that standard width, standard width range. And you do want a variety of fabrics. It would probably be a lot easier to just make big squares and sew them into big triangles, but we want that texture and that variation that goes from a group of fabrics that have some unifying element to your eye. Lights and darks, cools and warms, blacks and whites, whatever your two groups are, you want a, a strong difference that your eye perceives. When you look at a fabric, you should know, oh, this is an A group. Oh, this is definitely B group. Those kind of middle fabrics are gonna muddy it up and make your, your star pattern not appear as clearly. So choose two strong groups with a contrast. And you want some variety in there. You can use some solid fabrics in there, but mix it with some prints and you can use a little bit of flannel in there to add some texture. The kit does have some flannel. Um, so you can kind of shake things up. I would not use a knit. So if it stretches when you go to get this fabric, um, not your first quilt. Stick with a woven fabric, um, Walmart, Joanne Fabrics, Fabric.com, uh, which is Amazon's fabric store, all the online quilting shops, your local quilting shop, they will have a section and it will be called Quilting Cotton. And that's what you want. It's lightweight, it's easy to sew, it's easy to handle, it's going to give you a great result. So stick with that for now. When you're advanced, you can mess with knits and all kind of weird stuff. I also don't recommend that you start off for your first time sewing on jeans, on denim, because it's heavier weight, it's just a lot more, it makes beautiful quilts, I'm not going to lie, but it's a lot more difficult to sort of manipulate those seams and push all that weight through your machine. Um, do that for your second quilt. You don't need to do that for your first quilt. Um, so for the background, you'll notice that the four corners are all background all the way around. So for your background, you'll need about 30 or 32 strips of that color group for, I'm calling it dark here for the star portion of our show. These, um, in the slides, it's this dark blue forming the star. You'll need about 18 to 20 -ish strips for that. And for your, and when I say strips in this example, I'm talking about 42 to 45 inch strips will give you enough fabric. Um, if you're harvesting this fabric from sheets, from clothing, and they're not that length, um, I will give you a little bit of the equivalence in the email. It's 120 inches of strips per block plus your center. So if you need that, if you're harvesting scrap, you need that number to figure it out. Um, there. It is. So that is the fabric that you will need in your homework for this first one is to go out and choose your colorway, wander around the fabric section, look around your house, see what's in your stash, um, get your fabrics together 
figure out what you like together, what looks good to your eye, figure out what your rule is for group A and group B, and what your pop of contrast makes you happy, um, and gather your fabric and start cutting those strips. So that's your homework. That's what you're going to need for the next session. Things that you will need later. If you want to spread out the cost and not buy this all at one time, um, this is stuff that you'll need eventually, but you don't need it right away. Backing. Think of the backing like a big sheet. So this is a large, solid piece of fabric that's going to go on the back of your quilt. So you've got your quilt top, where you've got your patchwork and you made your star design, and then you'll have a layer of batting. And that is this. So it's kind of a fuzzy, almost felt-like, um, this is the cotton polyester blend, but um, it comes in cotton, it comes in wool, and they take needles and they punch it all together and um, felt it all together. And this is what adds the bounce and softness and the insulation and the puffiness to the quilt and makes the quilting look good. So it's the stuffing of your quilt. Um, and then you'll have your backing. And normally the backing is just one big sheet of fabric. Now this quilt is about 54 by 54 inch square. And I just said your fabric is usually 45 inches wide. So what you'll have to do is get a piece of fabric long enough for your quilt times two, you cut, put them next to each other and sew a seam and then you have a big piece. And you won't really notice that one seam um, it'll sort of get lost in the solid or in the print of it, and you won't really notice that one seam. So you seam that together to make a piece the right shape to cover the whole back of your quilt. And you always want your batting and your backing to be bigger than your top quilt. When you go to quilt it, it's going to scrunch the fabric in a little bit. And then you also, when you're sewing it, you need handles. You need to be able to hold on to that project. So when you make your layers, the top quilt that we're going to piece together. Um, they call that piecing or patchwork when you do the top. And then you're batting and then you're backing. And when you sandwich that together, you've got to be able to hold on to it. So you need the backing and the batting to be bigger than your top quilt. And then after that gets all quilted, you'll trim that away and square it up. So for this quilt, you'll need about four yards of a regular standard 45 inch fabric. Again, stick with a woven a nice quilting cotton or something with no stretch is going to be a lot easier for you. Um, and if you get a 108, so these are fabrics that are woven 108 inches wide. It's an extra wide fabric that's made specifically for big projects, um, curtains. You have to cut a big wide skirt piece for a large skirt, um, a lot of like home decor, like if you're making slip covers and quilt backings because they know you need a big wide piece of fabric. So they go ahead and make it 108 inches wide. So then you don't need to piece it sideways. You just need a piece long enough and cut it off and you'll actually trim off the excess. So you need about one and three quarter yards of 108 to do the back of this. And you're not gonna find that at Walmart, but they do have it at fabric.com, your online quilt shops, your local quilt shop, um, Joanne Fabrics, uh, just Walmart doesn't carry 108s. So you will you can find it. Um, what's nice about that is you don't have to line up and do that center seam. And we'll talk about how to do that when it's time, but um, it's a lot easier to just not have to do it. <laughs> so batting, we talked about that. Again, that's something you'll need later. You don't need to buy that right away. That comes in typically standard size packages. There's a crib size, there's a throw size, and then like bed sizes like twin king, queen, all those sizes. You want a low loft batting. So they make the super puff polyester. It's like an inch thick. If you get a Build-A-Bed kit at Walmart with the comforter and the sheets and the shams, and those um, comforters are like really thick and fluffy, don't start with that for your first quilt. They make beautiful quilts, but um, it's a lot of bulk to wrestle through your domestic machine. And you're going to want to start with something low loft. It gives a very um, old fashioned, traditional look. The quilting shows up beautifully. They're a little bit lighter, which to me makes the quilt more usable. If a quilt is so hot, you never really have the opportunity that your house is that cold that you need a quilt 
that pot. So I like them a little bit lighter so you can use it more often and pull it out and layer it with other things. Um, they have 100% cotton. They have 80-20 um, cotton blends are very popular. There's wool. I mean, they make silk batting. I'm not paying for silk batting. That's going to go inside the quilt and you're never going to see. I don't know who's using that. I'm sure it's beautiful. Most battings come in this natural color, sort of the unbleached cotton color, which is got a little bit of a creamy hue to it, like that. Um, if your quilt has a lot of a sheer, really, really white fabric on it, you might look for a lighter colored, they make like snow white, like bleached white battings. You might like that. Make sure that you are selecting a quilt batting. They have products in the stores like um, craft fleece and that sort of thing. And the best way I can describe that, they are like, they're supposed to be moldable. They're like crispy and hard. It's not going to give you like a comfy soft drape for blankets. So just make sure that it's quilt batting and not like project batting or project fleece. Um, so for this one, if you are not getting the kit, so the kit comes pre-cut to the right size, you just get it, you fold it out, and you're done. Um, most throw size battings will work, and you can trim it down. You can make what I call Franken batting. So if you have smaller pieces of batting laying around, you can actually sew those together and patch them together. No one's going to notice that seam in the batting and um, cobble together a piece of batting big enough to cover your project. and um, and make that size and shape that you need. So um, use what you got. I'm frugal. I believe in being resourceful and using what you have and, and saving money because then you can buy more fabric and make more clothes. <laughs> um, and then also what you'll need um, later is binding. So our quilt is made of two and a half inch strips, which is a piece of fabric about like so. And your binding is also gonna be two and a half inch strips. So if you're buying yardage, you can buy a little bit of extra yardage, tack on an extra half yard of whatever color you want your binding to be. You use your accent color, I think that'd be really pretty. You could use your background color, you could use your star color group, you could use um, the leftovers of all your strips would work. So you're gonna wanna factor in about six additional strips. So it's all the inches around your quilt, plus you need a little bit extra for seaming and when you go to join it together, you need a little bit of, of leeway of extra material to do the joining that you'll trim off. So it's always better to have a little more than a little less because it's easy to trim off. Um, if you're a little bit short and you're trying to make like a, add like a little half inch piece, you're going to have a lot of wonky weird seams and it's just not as nice. So err on the side of having a little much. Your binding can be a little bit of extra material from the yardage you bought. It can be the same, it can be different. I mean, it should look like it belongs on the same quilt, but um, people do contrast, people do blendy. Go with what looks pleasing to your eye. Same thing with the backing. You have the quilt front with your star and your background here, and you fold over the corner of the quilt and you see the backing. It should look like it belongs on the same quilt, but it doesn't have to be exactly the same. It doesn't have to be matchy-matchy. If you, um, like a fun accent color back there. And the backing is a great place to use big prints. By the time you chop up your prints into these two and a half inch strips for the front, you're not gonna see a large section. Like if you have a big flower forming, you're just gonna see a little strip of it in the strips. So sometimes you'll hear those called hero prints. If you have a big print that you like and you wanna see it intact, whole, the all of the pattern showing up on the fabric. The back is a great place to do that because it's a big old chunk of solid fabric and you can see um, all the details and the full extent of the pattern developing. So if I use a big print, I tend to use it on the back or um, if I had a large solid block. So that's your fabric needs. Basically, you're gonna have two and a half inch strips, whether you cut those yourself or buy them already cut through the kit or just in a pre-cut. So Jelly Roll is a brand name. That's like saying Kleenex. There's also two and a half inch strips called by other names by other companies. Um, 
but I mean, they're at Walmart, they're at Joanne Fabrics, they're at fabric.com. They're at all the, they're your local quilt shop. Please support your local quilt shop. Um, Jelly Roll is like a brand name, but if you say Jelly Roll, they know what you mean. There's pre-cut two and a half inch strips. It's a standard size of already cut fabric. And then you just get right to the sewing. They're a little more expensive. You're going to pay for it in money or labor one way or the other. So it kind of comes out in the wash. Um, the benefit of a pre-cut is that they've already sort of combined and assorted the fabrics up into color schemes for you. So if you can find one that looks like what you want your quilt to look like, um, most times when you buy yardage off the bolt, the store will have a minimum cut that they'll sell you. And some stores it's a quarter yard, some stores it's a half yard. So if you're trying to get a lot of different fabrics, but you only need a little bit of each one, it can be difficult to sort of assemble and collate that because you're going to have to buy probably a half yard of all those different fabrics, which is way more fabric than you need. And then you'll cut strips off of it and have a bunch of leftover, which is good for another quilt. Um, but if you just need a little bit of a lot of different fabrics, that's where the pre-cuts really shine as far as um, making it easy for you to do that. And then you're not buying a bunch of fabric that you don't need for this project. Okay, so the big takeaway is your three color groups. You want a strong contrast, whatever your rule is for your color scheme and your groups. You're gonna have your background group of prints, different colors and um, prints that you put together that make up your background. You're gonna have assorted fabrics for your star and you're gonna have one accent color and you really just need one strip for that accent color. It's not a lot of fabric. It should be enough of a different color that really pops and stands out and makes that um, center. All right, let's go ahead and take a pause here. I am going to take a break from sharing that. And we're gonna take a little uh, road trip. And I'm gonna do um, an infinity window for a second here. So let's take a look at um, some different examples of what a log cabin can be. I'm gonna come in and grab a sample, sorry. So this is a cabin rose design. And if you take a look at this, what they've done here is cut like a five-sided, any sort of closed polynomial <laughs> will make the center of a log cabin style quilt. So the only rule is center out. That's what makes it a log cabin just spiraling out. Everything else is up for grabs. Not for this quilt, because that's not our pattern. But when you start doing these on your own, um, throw the rules out. Vary it on whatever way you want to vary it. So here they've used, they're creating sort of a rose look, like a little rosette. And they started with a, a five-sided shape in the middle. And as long as it has straight sides and goes all the way around, you can use, I've seen triangles, I've seen squares, I've seen rectangles. You can put anything, you can put an octagon in there. Um, and they've kind of varied the width and made it sort of random and improvisational looking. And by doing the color scheme, like these reds and then these greens, it makes like a rose type block. So that is one variation, the cabin rose. So really, like, no rules. I mean, for ours, we have a set design, but we're going to follow our pattern. We're going to make it simple. We're all going to be similar. Um, but once you start making your own log cabins, so this is my little sample. This is a true scrappy log cabin. This is quilt as you go method. So think of this as a mini quilt where the log cabin is the whole quilt. So I started with a rectangle here, and this is for real scraps. This is stuff that I had just in a cabinet, and I pulled it out and I cut it in strips. And so I had this rectangle, and I started here, and I found a little piece of fabric that was long enough to cover the side, and I sewed it on. And then I found a piece of fabric that was long enough to cover this side, and I sewed it on. And then I did this one, and then I did this one. And I just used what I had. I just grabbed what was there. So you don't have that strong diagonal. You don't have a square in the middle. 
All of these are different colors. I feel like they went together, but I just grabbed what was in the pile. Um, the width of the strips is all different and sort of random in this one. So this is very improvisational. This is a great way to use up scraps if you have um, leftover fabric, from different things laying around. You want to make something, you don't want to spend money. Um, use what you got. So this is um, very scrappy, very improvisational. It kind of looks modern and abstract. If you're doing that strong diagonal, the more traditional grouping your light and your dark, then you have that half square triangle. So let's have a look at these quilts. All of these quilts are done with log cabins with that strong diagonal that gives it the look of like two triangles and you just rotate those blocks around and you can make all these different layouts. So this one over here, you've got up in the upper right corner, you've got sort of these diamond and diamond layout and they've got the Missouri star in the middle. That's a little bit similar to ours. Underneath that, um, this is kind of a fun scrappy look. They have grouped darks and lights, but you can see in those darks, it's a lot of like really random colors. They're not sticking to all blues. They're not sticking to any specific color. They've just done all their real dark ones, all their real light ones and kind of get rid of the medium ones because they're not going to give you that clear you want your eyes to know right away, these are two groups. And whatever delineates those two groups, just stick with whatever your rule is. So um, you've got a um, layout here with where they're making like diamonds. By turning all of the darks together in the center, you get kind of a diamond shape. This one in the corner is kind of interesting because it they've altered the diamonds light dark light and you sort of get the secondary pattern that looks like kind of an x and squares like a larger square on point and sort of white x pattern forms that's kind of neat um and i like this graphic because it's got a little bit of everything so there's some sort of traditional settings for their you can use half square triangles or log cabins to create the same effect. So the straight setting up in the upper left corner, um, all the diamonds, all the triangles are facing the same directions. Fields and furrows is that diagonal. So you've rotated them to form rows. It's supposed to be like you plowed your field and made your furrows. These diamonds they call um, sunshine and shadows. And then um, there's like a diamonds in diamond. And the next one is a chevron. And I think that's really cool because you can do one big chevron or you could do smaller chevrons going across. So it depends on how many log cabins you make, how small you make them, how big you make your quilt. Um, this guy over here, this is a very elaborate star that they've made just from rotating those log cabins around. So you either need tiny little strips and tiny little log cabins and lots and lots of them or a big quilt to create a pattern that elaborate. But you can see this is just with the traditional layout, the traditional block, strong diagonal, all the strips the same width. You can make all of these quilts from that. Now, you can intentionally vary your strip width. So this is a pattern by, ooh, this is a pattern by Missouri Star Quilt Company called uh, River Log Cabin. I like Missouri Star. You'll find that I use them a lot. Sorry about that. So what they've done here is very intentionally varied the width of these strips and it creates a rounded look. So you get the look of doing curved piecing without all of those are straight seams. You don't have to sew any curves, which are much harder. So they've intentionally altered the width and created that pattern to give it a rounded look. If you alter the width of your strips randomly, you get more sort of a modern abstract look. All right, so that's just some of the variation that you can create with a log cabin varying the block itself. And then using just the traditional log cabin, you can create a lot of secondary patterns by rotating that and changing the layout as you assemble those blocks into rows and columns in the full quilt. 
So I'm going to teach you one thing, but you'll be able to do so many different things with that one thing. Let's go back to our presentation. See if I can help. <laughs> There it is. Okay, so that's just to give you some ideas about colorways and how they come together. And in the future, if you want to take this another direction, there's your fabric needs. We're going to take a little minute and talk about, um, now that I have my sample in hand. So imagine this is a mini quilt, and this is one log cabin, but you would have all of your log cabins sewn together. And this top piece of fabric here, where I've done my piecing or patchwork, they'll call it, this is sheet of fabric is the top quilt and then underneath that I have my batting or my puffy layer that's like the stuffing of your quilt and then in the back you can see I've used a larger print here because I can see it if I were to cut a little strip um this part of the strip would look like it's cream white whatever this part of the strip would look like it's dark so where do I put this strip in my lights or my darks because it's kind of eh, both so a big print like that looks good on the back. So this is one solid sheet. If this were a bigger quilt, you can see how um, you could get a nice big print to fit on there and show up and be sort of intact. So these seams here, where I've sewn the pieces of fabric together, you don't really see that thread. So usually we'll use kind of a neutral color. If you want to know if your thread's going to show up, um, take a picture of your thread and your fabric with the black and white setting of your camera. And if they look like the same color, you won't see it. It's going to, it's going to blend nicely. And if you did get a little bit of thread sticking out from your seam, it's going to blend and camouflage and it, it won't be like a sore thumb sticking out there. This stitching here that goes through the layers after the um, top quilt is sewn together and then my sandwich is made. This is what makes it a quilt. This is the actual quilting. It's stitching through all three layers to secure it together. And for that, you are gonna see the stitching. That's like top stitching on a garment. So you will see that. So you wanna pick a thread color. The most forgiving is gonna be a color that matches. And it's going to look nice um, if it's the same value. So what do I mean by value? Um, if you take a picture with the black and white mode of your camera, they look like the same color. So you could use a different color, but if it's similar, it's gonna be very forgiving. Um, it's gonna coordinate nicely. You're not gonna see every bib and bobble of what you do. But if you make a little mistake or you waver a little bit, it's gonna be less obvious. And all you'll see is that nice overall texture that the quilting gives to your quilt. Um, so if you just love the look of black thread and white fabric, and you want to do a contrast, you can do that, but just be aware, um, white fabric with black thread, you're going to see everything. If you're a super confident quilter, and you really want the quilting to be the main thing that pops off the page at you, go ahead and pick a high contrast color, and just know that it's going to show up. Good, bad, or indifferent, you're going to see it. Um, if you don't know which way to go, go lighter than you think. Um, I rarely use all the way white or all the way black thread. Um, I tend to try to pick something close to how light or dark the rest of the quilt is in a blending or complementing color. Um, but if you have black fabric with white thread, that's really going to stand out. And if you have white fabric with black thread, that's really going to stand out. So um, you would go so with something kind of medium. That's going to blend across the, the most of it. You can also have fun with it. You can use a variegated thread. That's a thread that every so often it changes color. And as you quilt along, you kind of get a rainbow effect. That can be fun. You can play with your threads. So it depends on how much you want to see your quilting and how confident you are with your quilting, how sort of camouflage and blendy, if you want it to be subtle and blend, if you want it to really like jump out at you and see the quilting, you can use a more sort of contrasty, color. My recommendation would use um, sort of a mid-tone and kind of a neutral color. If it's warm colors, you could use like a taupe. If it's cool colors, you could use like a nice medium gray. I use a lot of this natural sort of creepy color, but I use a lot of those colors in my quilting too. My 
um, piecing. So it blends. This has got like strong notes of cream in it. So when I use cream thread, it kind of picks up the cream in all the fabrics. If this was solid black, that cream thread would stick out and look a little weird. So go with something sort of mid-tone to your quilt that looks like it belongs with the quilt. And let's also talk about this edge. So I'm I'm showing you my sample here and I've got these three layers, but this is kind of gross and messy. This is not a finished edge. So this is where your binding will come along and we're gonna take strips of fabric. So our quilt is two and a half inch strips, but also your binding is gonna be two and a half inch strips. And you're gonna take that fabric and you'll encase these edges and it'll be nice and neat and tidy and enclosed. That's not exactly what it looks like, but you'll have a nice, neat, tidy edge at the end. The sample is a part so you can see in there. So just think of this as a mini quilt that's been quilted and sandwiched, but it has not yet been bound to close these edges and make this nice and neat. So side note, um, your fabric has a salvage, which is the, the bound edge where they wove it um, in manufacturing, and that's a nice tight edge that's not going anywhere. So let's have a look. Here's some salvage. And a lot of times the salvage is real obvious because it'll be white and have words on it. So you see how this is white and it has basically labeling what the piece of fabric is or where it was made or what have you. And you'll also notice, I'm not sure if you can see, but there's like little pokey holes. Do you remember old printers that were like dot matrix printers? They would have these perforated strips on the side with holes that the printer would grab the paper and pull it through. Um, it's kind of the same thing. The machinery they used to make this kind of grabs um, and pulls the fabric through by this. So both sides, you've got your 45 inch width of fabric, fabric, both sides are gonna be bound with a salvage. And then this side, you see how that's messy and fraying and there's no salvage there. This is just like open and loose. The only thing holding this together is the friction between the yarns of the fabric holding that on. So if I am rough with this and I um, mouth on that really hard and um, I can fray this and I can actually warp that and sort of stretch it and change the shape and size and make it weird. So when your fabric is cut with the raw edge, don't be rough on it. This salvage, this is not going anywhere. That's, that's going nowhere. Um, but on the edges of the fabric, when it's raw edge like that and it's just loose, don't be hard on that. Handle your fabric gently so it's even shape. All right, so um, let's talk a minute about the cutting. I've talked a lot about two and a half inch strips. I know you're like, you're not really seeing me. Let's aim this guy down. Let's get a little closer. Okay. So um, this is what your two and a half inch strips will look like. If you are buying the kit or you are buying um, a jelly roll or pre-cut um, pre two and a half inch strips, you're going to have this wide times about 42 to 45 inches long strips and you'll have a salvage at each end and they should be nice and straight like when you open up at this fold if they were cut nice and parallel you'll have a nice straight edge here and here all right if you are cutting your own let's talk a little bit about cutting there's two ways to do it if you're going to do this a lot it will be worth it for you. I'm going to bring this right on down so you can really see. It will be worth it for you to get this set up. This is a nice to have. It's a lot easier. So a cutting mat, an acrylic roller. This has a smooth edge, but it's got like a thickness to it. So I can push up against the straight edge and it's got the measurement markings on it. And then a rotary cutter, which is something like this and then this is the guard this is not a knife this is a spinning razor blade of death all right this is not a little pizza cutter this is really sharp so just be aware and when you set this down as soon as you're done cutting 
you are going to put that guard up. Don't fool around with this. This is a serious tool. If you're cutting with children, um, be very aware this is much sharper than a knife and much sharper than scissors. It's made to cut through multiple layers of natural fabric with hard cellulose plant material in there. But it's excellent for high volume cutting. So this is my little pretend piece of fabric. And you'll see there's two layers here and I have it nice and smoothly pressed. So I have a good baseline to cut, nice straight baseline. Um, and if this were 45 inches long and I folded it in half and pretend this is just a cut edge, but pretend this is your salvage and they're lined up nicely in my pretend world. If this is a 45 inch piece of fabric and I pull this in half, that's still like 22, 23 inches long. That's still a lot to cut. So my preference is to fold this up and bring this fold to match the salvage. And what's important when you're cutting quilting fabric, if you're doing this method, is that this fold and this fold are exactly parallel. If I have my fabric like this, and then I take a ruler and I cut down here, I mean, that's exaggerated, then what I will end up with is hips in the fabric. Let's see what that looks like. So this is like way off. You wouldn't be that far off, but if you were a little off, I'm gonna take my piece of fabric. So I'm gonna go ahead and line this fold up to the line on my mat. And then I'm gonna line my ruler up to a line on the mat. So this fold and the edge of my ruler at a right angle. So this is the wrong way because I don't have this lined up. See how these are at an angle? And this fold is at an angle to this fold is straight. This one's like wonky. All right, let's see what that does. And I'm gonna take my rotary cutter. So if my folds are not parallel, this line looks straight, but when I open this up, we'll see how I did. Now you can see that this line has like beaks, like hips. Get you out of here. But you can see that this is making an angle here. And then down here at this fold, it's a little less obvious, but it makes a beak going out, like a hip sticking to the side. So if I look along the edge of this fabric, it's once I unfold it, if I didn't get my folds parallel, this is not a straight line. Let's lay it along this straight line in the mat. See how this is going out? I'm not the page. This goes out and in and out. So what I really have is more of a zigzag. All right, so that's how not to cut. I know in garment making, it's very important to have, um, to be on the straight of grain. If you don't garment sew and you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Um, it's nice to be on the straight of grain for quilting. It'll help you be more precise. But what's important is that this line and this line, this fold and this fold are parallel. And if you had salvage here, you know the salvage is straight. So if you line this fold with your salvage, nice and precise, then you know that this fold is also gonna be parallel. So this edge is now messy because I made it messy. You see all this poking out and it's kind of, uh, uh. so you'll lay your ruler nice and precise. So I have this fold exactly along this line going this way. And these lines are square to each other. I have my ruler, I'm gonna take my time and place it exactly on this line going this way. And you take your rotary cutter um, your blade is against the ruler and I'm holding the ruler firmly and I'm going to slide along and just clean up that edge. So I'm going to get rid of all this messy, junky stuff and throw that out. Gone. So now I want a two and a half inch strip. So this ruler, these sort of larger lines with the hashes are one inch, one inch, one inch. And then this sort of skinny solid line is the half. So I'm going to line up the two and a half on the edge of my fabric. Once you squared the edge, rulers are for measuring, mats are for aligning. So measure with your ruler, unless you absolutely have, um, don't have a ruler big enough to do it. 
So I'm going to count over one, two, and a half. And I can see that fabric through my clear ruler. And I know that my folds are parallel. I can even check against my ruler and make sure that they're nice and neat and parallel. So I don't have those hips and beaks. And I take my rotary cutter. I did not follow my own rule. I had that open. And then there's your two and a half inch strip. Now imagine I had a whole sheet of fabric. I'd be doing a lot more of that. And let's see how I did. You open that up and you look down the strip. It looks pretty straight. If I look in my fold, there's um, it's pretty parallel in there. It's not too much of a beak or a hip there. So I must have done pretty all right. Okay, so that's how you make your two and a half inch strips. If you're going from yardage or you're harvesting from clothing or sheets or scrap fabric from around your house, you want to buy a pre-cut. They're already cut. If you want to buy the kit, you get an assortment of dark fabrics. This could be your star or your background. You choose that option. An assortment of light fabrics. This one looks like chicken wire and I just think it's so cute. Um, and then this one um, has a little hint of gold and it says thank you in a bunch of languages and I just love that. I think it's so cute. So you've got your assortment of, this is basically your white group and this is your um, black group and you get that black and white colorway. And for your accent color, you have your choice of a hot pink, a sunny yellow, a royal blue. So you can see this is pretty, the black and white colorway is kind of neutral. And depending on what you pair it with as the accent, it can be kind of fun and girly. It can be more masculine. And here is the lime green, which has that little bit of a check pattern in it. Um, I think if you paired this with a gold, it would be very elegant and it would be a nice decor throw for any home. It would really um, go any direction you need to take it. So that's the kit. If you want the kit. While wow, supplies last. Okie doke. Oh, the other way to cut a strip. I'm out of sample fabric, so let's pretend this is a big piece of fabric. This is a water erasable marker. For this, um, where I'm gonna mark, I'm gonna cut. So it doesn't matter what you use. You could use a Sharpie for this. You could use a ballpoint pen. Use what you got. Um, I use the fabric um, water erasable fabric marker because that's what I have. That's what I like to use. So let's pretend I'm making a one inch strip because that's how much fabric I have left. And then you can use any straight edge. This doesn't have to be a fancy rotary, rotary cutting ruler. We're going to use any straight edge. We're going to take um, our marker, get right in there, and go like this, get right in there. I'm angling the tip toward my straight edge. This could be like a regular school plastic ruler, as long as it has a smooth line down the side. Um, some of them have like nubs, like you can feel the inch marks on the side, and that's going to make your line go doo doo doo. And then you want a good pair of scissors. If you are going to do this with scissors, you want good, sharp fabric scissors. And do not use those scissors for anything but fabric. They are only for fabric and always for fabric. And you write it right on there. And people get grounded if they touch mom's sewing scissors and use them on anything else like paper. And then with a steady hand and a nice close eye, you're going to carefully snip with scissors. You can see how this takes a little bit more time and a little bit more sort of fussiness and skill to get a nice straight line. And you just slowly work your way. If you're good at cutting fabric, you can do this. You can learn to do this. Everyone can learn to do this, but it does take a little more skill. Let's see how it is. Be straight. So it's doable with regular scissors. If you're going to do this a lot, it's worth it to invest in the cutting mat, the rulers, the acrylic rulers, and the rotary cutter. If you might only do this once and you don't want to spend all that money, you can do that with scissors. The other way to not buy all this um, cutting equipment is to just buy pre cuts. 
So that's your three ways to end up with your two and a half inch strips. All right. Awesome. Let's get this back up. Where did it go? All right, so that's cutting. Um, I did not really go over tools. Next. Get the presentation back up. Are we seeing it? We're seeing it. Good. Okay. So, um, you know, this is crooked and I have a just enough OCD that's driving me bonkers. Um, so that's your fabric needs. Let's talk a little bit about equipment and supplies. And we hit on some of these. So obviously you'll need a sewing machine. Any sewing machine will do. Um, there is my Juki. Um, you do not want to do this with one of those teeny tiny handheld sewing machines that looks like to me a stapler don't waste your money don't use those but um any sewing machine that does a straight stitch will do a great job for this you can use a small featherweight i sewed on a featherweight from walmart for many decades and i promise you the limiting element in that scenario was me to the very end that sewing machine did everything i needed it to do um there are expensive sewing machines, there are bigger sewing machines, there are fancier sewing machines. Um, but to get started, um, I think the best value for your buck, there are tons of sewing machines at the Goodwill and the thrift store where somebody maybe passed away, the kids don't sew, they don't know what to do with it. You've got an older, great, high quality sewing machine. Those old sewing machines are like unbreakable and the kids are just trying to get rid of it and they take it to the Goodwill and they're just trying to unload it. Um, and you can get a lot of bang for your buck and a lot of value with a thrift store sewing machine. And old sewing machines tend to be really heavy, really high quality, um, and just they're still in good shape and they still work because there's nothing to break on them. Um, but you can get a fancy sewing machine. Um, Walmart has very decent featherweights, which is like a small machine with like a six inch throat. So from the needle to where the machine motor is, um, six inches is small, but it's, it's decent. Um, for like the 120 to $150 range. So that's a, a good starter machine, especially if you're not in a position to make a big investment or you're not sure how much you're going to love this. Um, quilting is like crack. So it's a little addictive, I'm warning you. <laughs> um, so if you're going to make stitches, you're going to need a way to get rid of stitches. So this is um, every sewist best friend. This is a seam ripper. So um, it kind of looks like this shape. And it's got a red ball here, whatever color ball. It's got a point here. This point is not sharp, but it's very pointy. And that's to get up under the stitches. And then in this crook of the little hook there, it's sharp. So, um, and a seam ripper is not a beginner's tool. It's every sewist tool. It doesn't mean that you made mistakes. It means you have high standards of quality. So if you put some stitches in and you don't love them or they're not where you wanted them to go, you will um, arrange the fabric where you can see the stitches. And you take the little point and you hook up under that stitch and you slide it up until the blade comes and cuts that stitch. And you'll go about every four stitches or so, the part that you want to get rid of. And then you come to the other side and you hook that thread and pull and the whole thing will go and come out. So you'll need a seam ripper. I do know of people that use teeny tiny scissors called hummingbird scissors instead of a seam ripper, but it's just a scissor with such a fine little point that you can get under that stitch and do the job of a seam ripper with a teeny tiny, um, they use them a lot for embroidery. I think they call them hummingbird scissors. But you'll need a seam ripper. This one I got from Quilt in a Day, it's all metal. It has a tiny fine point so you can get under those stitches and a really sharp blade that stays sharp. I love this one. This is from Quilt in a Day and it's all metal and it is wonderful. 
quilt of the day is Eleanor Burns. She's my spirit animal. Okay, what else do you need? Thread. We talked about thread. Um, kind of the standard color for piecing is a light kind of light to medium gray. And that's because no matter what fabrics you're using, um, light to medium gray is kind of blendy and camo-y. So on the stitches that I don't want to see in these seams, if I do get a little thread poking out, it's not going to be obvious and you won't really notice it. So it kind of doesn't matter what color you use for your piecing. But those typical colors, like a light medium gray, that's going to be kind of blendy and camo and disappear. If you do get some poking out, you don't really want to see that. Good fabric scissors. We talked about that. Um, a good sharp pair of scissors um, you will need, and you keep them sharp by only cutting fabric with these. Do not cut paper. Do not cut construction paper. Do not cut open packages from Amazon. Just fabric. You will need a ruler with some kind of straight edge. So um, I use these fancy acrylic quilting rulers. This one's like 20 years old. I'm still using it. Um, some of the marks are gone, but I know where they are. Um, you don't have to use this if you don't want to invest in this at this point. Any um, ruler that gives you the measurements and a straight edge is going to work. So like a regular school ruler, as long as you slide your finger along the edge and it, um, you don't feel the bumps where they put like the inch markings, just any straight edge will do you. This one is nice. Um, so from this side, if I'm cutting a dark fabric, I put this side up and the markings are yellow so I can see them on the dark fabric. If I'm cutting a lighter fabric, I put this side up and the markings are black and I can see it. So I always can see the markings no matter what color my fabric is. I just turn the ruler over. If you're gonna buy one quilting ruler, this is like a six by 24 acrylic ruler. This is a great universal size. You can do just about anything with this. So um, if you're going to go with this, this goes with the rotary cutter. It's come in different sizes and handle styles. And you need a mat because you need something to cut on. You need this razor blade to push down and roll, not on your good wood table. And then you need that straight edge to roll it along. Um, but for this class, that's a nice to have. You can do the job with scissors if you need to. You need your fabric. We talked about that a lot. You need an iron and an ironing surface. So there's my ironing board and my iron. I have a whole beef with steam irons. Maybe we shouldn't get into this. You have water in a metal chamber and little nooks and crannies. It's just a matter of time before you start to have rust, leaking, mustiness. I don't have the time or inclination to clean that stupid thing out every time I use it. So what I do is I take um, a regular dry iron. Um, it's a normal iron that you get anywhere, but I just turn the steam setting off and I do not fill it with water. And it even says on marker on there, dry. And then um, you can see what this was. And it's the refillable one. And it's a nice fine mist. And I just put clean water in here. And this I got for free when the product was used up. And I just put water in there. So if this gets yucky, I mean, I'm in control of what's in here. And if this gets yucky, this was free. I just throw it away and get another one. And I just mist the fabric. And I take a hot, dry iron and I run it over there. And when the hot iron hits the, the little dampness, that makes steam. And it's enough steam. And then I don't have to worry about my iron rusting and leaking and making little stainy droplets. Because um, sooner or later, even the best iron is going to start leaking and rusting on you. So this is my personal beef. This is my personal preference. Kind of my little soapbox. People love steam irons. They're great. If you like a steam iron and you're happy with it, you use it. But this is my method. I like to have my spray separate. Um, and I've even seen people put a drop of essential oils in here and make it smell good. Mine still smells like the breeze a little bit. And then I can control that. Also, I use this. So this is a water erasable marker. For some reason, these are always blue. And you can get these at any sewing store. You can get these at Walmart. And so you write with this, and then you spray it with the mist of water, and it goes away. Um, let's talk marking implements, because I already am. For what we're doing, you're always going to cut on the lines that you make. So you can really use anything. You can use a fine tip sharpie. You can use a ballpoint pen. If you're going to do this a lot, you'll want um, marking tools that are made for fabric and come off. 
So this is water erasable. You spritz a little water in there, or if you threw it in the washer, all your marks would come off. This is Taylor's chalk. Comes in a little wedge like this. And you just take kind of that sharpened edge and you slide it along where you want to make a mark. Obviously, if this were black fabric, I would use the white one. These come in different colors. So pick a color that's going to show up on your fabric and it makes kind of a light line there. And when you want to take it off, you just rub it off. It's just chalk and it comes right off. It also come off in the washer. And then here's my frugal hack because you know I'm cheap. This is a sliver of bar soap that got too small to use. You can take a paring knife and sharpen one edge of it. And unless your fabric is really light, I haven't tried this with a dark soap on the light fabric. Before. I use this to condition my thread for hand sewing and coat my thread instead of beeswax because I'm too cheap to buy. But I can take, let's do a darker fabric where you can really see. So here's my dark fabric. And if I had sharpened this, it would be an even finer line. See how that made a white line? And that's just soap. So obviously that's going to wash right out when I throw this thing in the washer. Because it's just soap. So that's not going to hurt anything. And it smells good. Like time. So that's my little cheap sewing hack. You know I got a hack for everything. Okay, and then sewing straight pins. This pattern is very easy and very forgiving. So you're going to pin... You can use sewing straight pins. I like these that have a big um, flat little plastic thing to hold on to. They're nice to get a grip. When you're first learning to sew, you're going to want to align these edges of your two pieces very carefully. And they're kind of fiddly and they kind of try to move around on you. So it's one less thing to think about. If you can take your edges of your fabric and align them very straight and even and tidy. And then you take your pin and put it in. If I'm going to be sewing this way, my pins are going to go that way. And if I can align this fabric exactly the way I want it. Let me put it this way. If you can't pin it straight and tidy the way you want it to be sewn, when you put it under the sewing machine, it's not going to magically get better. So you want to align it nice and neat and tidy. And if it helps you to put a metal pin in there, a straight pin, um, I recommend you do that. It's one less thing to fiddle with and figure out in the heat of the moment as you're putting this under the sewing machine. If you're not a straight pin user, you're pinning, but you can finger pin. So you're still aligning the edges. Instead of pinning with a metal pin, I'm going to pinch and pin that with my finger. And then I feed that through the machine basically up to my finger. And then I go down again. And I'm going to do a line, pinch, sew. So I'm still pinning, but you can pin with this pin. Or you can pin with this pin and finger pin. You can also press with an iron or you can make a crease and you let's do this against the table. Scrape it with your fingernail and finger press. So you can press with a metal iron or press with your fingers. You can pin with a metal pin. You can pin with your fingers. The metal way is better. Finger way is faster. Okay, so that's your must-haves. Um, let's move on to the right box. You've got optionals. So I love a large square template. So when you get your block done, it's going to have like this one. You know, the edges aren't exactly straight and they're got little fuzzy wuzzies and whatever. So you can take this square template and um, straighten two sides. You cut that and then you just made this corner perfect. So you turn it over here and then you go here and you cut the other two sides, and because this side and this side are at right angles and they're perfectly straight, you can use this as a template and make your blocks exactly square and nice and straight and all uniform. And it's got the measurements. So my advice, if you um, are going to do this a lot and you can afford it, you choose to afford it, um, I would get a square ruler. This is a really nice tool to have and get the biggest one you're inclined to afford. 
because I can make a one inch square with this ruler, but um, any ruler you can make the little numbers with. But what limits me is this. It gets more challenging if I'm trying to make a block bigger than this. So I think these come up to like 22 inches and I kind of wish I had the 22 inch one. I have, this is a 12 and a half inch square. And it's easy to square up to 12 and a half inch blocks with this and trim them off nice and perfect and even and make them all match and be nice. So this is like your cutting template for your block or for cutting out squares. You can do that with a little more work with this guy. So this guy's a little more universal. You're only gonna buy one. I would buy this really long one. Um, and so what you do is you make one side straight and that becomes square and then you're going to take one of these lines and line that up with your side that you just cut and made straight. So that'll be here. And you go, and you cut that. Now you have two at 90 degrees and you flip the piece of fabric and you line that up with the line you just made perfectly straight and you cut. So you're just working your way around the square with this one. So this one, you got to make four cuts and you got to line them up to the line. This one, it lines up your 90 degree for you and you only do twice, you go and then the other side, so you get it done in two cuts with this. And it's made to help you make things square. So this is a nice to have. Again, you can use like a regular like school ruler, any kind of straight edge, and you can mark it with whatever marking tool and you can come with your scissors and carefully cut it out. So um, that's optional. And then the acrylic rulers, and the mat, you need a surface to cut on, and the rotary cutter, also optional. If you know you're going to do this, totally worth it. Um, a nice to have for this class. Um, you can use pre-cuts, you can get the kit, or you just do it with scissors. It's more work with scissors, but you can do it all with scissors if you need to. Okay, now these are things that you will need, but you're not going to need them until later. Let's grab the sprays. So, um, I made my top quilt. Mm -hmm. All right, so this this top sheet of fabric that has my patchwork or my piecing on it, and this is going to be my full top quilt. Um, you know, my sample is one block, but pretend this is all of them, and they've all been sewn together like a big sheet of, of this. And then I have my batting, and then I have my backing. I need to temporarily fold these layers together nice and smooth and flat so that I can come back and do the quilting or the stitching that you see. And temporarily holding your sandwich together is called basting. And there's um, several ways to do it, but for this class, we're gonna do, um, you can do spray based. So this is, um, you know, kind of like spray paint, but it's glue, it's like a light glue. Um, it'll say something about basting or quilting on there. It'll say sewable, it does not gum up needle. And this is important, it will say temporary. So you will use this glue and then when you're done with your quilting and it's fully quilted, um, when you put your finished quilt in the washing machine, this goes away. So you're not left with any kind of hard or sticky residue. So there's lots of different brands of this. Um, a really popular one is 505. This is Spray and Bond. Um, Dritz makes one. Um, June Taylor makes one. They have this at Walmart. They have this anywhere they sell fabric or remotely quilty type things. They have this online. Um, so this is spray based. And you just put a light spray of this. It's almost like hairspray. Don't go to the hardware store and use like aerosol construction adhesive. Get one that's made for sewing. That's one way to baste your layers together and temporarily hold your sandwich in place for you to do your quilting. Um, the other option is safety pins. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. These are the two we're going to choose from. And so you've got your layers. Pretend these weren't quilted yet. And you will just go and you put your safety pin in and out and close your safety pin. And that's going to hold your layers together. You do that sort of sprinkle those across the top of your quilt enough to keep it together while you're sewing it. Um, now, when I'm sewing along, I'm either gonna have to sew around this pin or take it out. And when I'm trying to smooth my layers out, I kind of have to like pick it up 
to get my um, pin like down in and back out. So I'm sort of like moving the layers around and they can kind of shift and get pick up tucks on the back. So um, this way is a little bit more difficult. And then you got to take all the safety pins out. So um, this one's a little bit easier. And then even easier, if you're buying the kit from me or when you're out shopping for batting, they have what's called fusible batting. So it has, think of it like a really fine um, layer of like hot glue. And so it's on the batting. So here's your middle batting layer. This one's sticky because I put spray base and it has not been washed. Um, so one side or both sides will have usable. And so you lay your layers together, smooth them out. You get them just where you want them. And then you take your iron, dry iron, and you iron over them for real dry iron. Not just put as my pet peeve. Um, and it will temporarily adhere your three layers together nice and smooth, exactly how you want them. And then you're, you can do all the quilting that you want. And then when you wash it, that goes away. And that's why you use a dry iron because, um, the um, adhesive disappears when you wash it. So if you use a steam iron, you're getting rid of the um, fusible as you're ironing and you, you've defeated the purpose. So you can buy that and read the label. Some of it's fusible on one side, some of it's fusible on both sides. What comes with the quit, kit is Hobbs Heirloom 80-20. So that's 80% cotton, 20% polyester, and it's fusible on both sides. So you'll just smooth your, your layers out how you want them. You put them on your ironing board and just run a hot iron over it. And you'll be able to like lift up and see if you lift up and they're together. It's just, you know, a few seconds. And you just kind of slowly move the iron over there. When you're choosing a batting, I think we already said that, low loft. Loft is how thick and poofy that is. This is between like an eighth and a quarter. Anything under a quarter inch is probably okay. You don't want to start out with a super thick batting. It's just too much to wrestle through a domestic machine, and it's it's not a good for a first quilt. You can, once you make your first quilt, you can experiment with all different kinds of battings and develop your own style and taste and do what you want to do. But for this first one, make it easier on yourself um, and do a nice, thin, sort of heirloom batting. It makes a nice quilt with like a good drape. I like it. And it's easy to start with. Okay, so we talked about the fabric marking pet of the chalk. We talked about spray based. Um, we talked at length about batting, backing, binding fabric, coordinating thread for quilting. We talked about that. Um, so that is for if you're going to do machine quilting. So there are lots of ways to quilt. There's hand quilting. There's free motion quilting. This lovely unit behind me is Big Bertha. That's a long arm quilting machine. Um, they call this quilting with your credit card because you send your quilt off to a long, your long arm quilter and they quilt it for you and send it back on this long arm. So this has this big long table. So my frame is 12 feet wide. You can do king coverlets on there. And it's kind of like a typewriter. You load the quilt in there and I have a strip about 18 inches of quiltable area. And I quilt down there and then I scroll the quilt through and advance it and I quilt another strip kind of back and forth, feeding the quilt through like a kind of like a typewriter. So I'm able to stretch out and hold a whole big quilt on the frame and get it all quilted. Um, so that's a long arm, which I will long arm your quilt for you if you want me to um, for the challenge. That's what I do. Um, but uh, I won't be teaching that in the challenge. And then there's free motion quilting, which you can do on a domestic machine, which we're not going to cover in this. And there's hand quilting, which we're not going to cover in this class. So the two options we're going to have for this class is um, machine quilting on your domestic machine or hand tying. So for hand tying, you usually want a thicker thread. So like embroidery floss is a good one and yarn is a good one. Um, and you'll, you'll see it. So you want to pick a color that looks nice. That you want to see with it, lay it on there. If it looks good to you, use it. Um, and you need a large eye needle. So the thread is thicker than regular thread, and you need to get it through the eye of the needle. So you need a large eye needle. And it can be curved or straight. 
And basically what you're going to be doing is a um, little knot. So you have your spot where you want to do a hand tying and you'll just go through twice, make a little knot. Usually they trim the tails about one inch. Usually they have visible tails that they leave that gives it that kind of homemade handcrafted look and it adds a little um, movement and texture, like a 3D element to your quilt top. I have seen people trim them off flush, but usually they leave a little tail for like a little kind of like fringe. And you generally want that a little bit thicker. And some people are real organized about it. So they might say, okay, these corners, I'm going to put a little hand tie at each corner. Some people just kind of scatter them across. But generally the rule for hand quilting is this. You take your fist, you put it on your quilt, and you want there to be a knot here and here. Anywhere you put your fist, you want to be touching um, from knot to knot. That's the general, that's how I learned. That's the old school way. If you can touch one thread and put your fist, you should be able to touch the other. Thread. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's really it. Your homework for this first section is to pick your colorway, get your fabric and get started cutting it if necessary. If you want to order the kit, you can message us. If you want to go out and pay a little bit more for pre-cuts, you can pay for pre-cuts and uh, what you spend in money, you'll get back in time. So it all comes out in the wash. I appreciate you all joining me. Any questions or comments, you can put those below. We'll check periodically and get back to you. You can also message us on the channel. This is um, on Facebook. We are Long Arming by Jacqueline, A-A-C-L-Y-N. Um, or you can hook us up on this channel. Or you can email me, longarmingbyjacqueline at gmail.com. All right. Have a great evening and we'll see you at the next session. If you're in the live group, it's um, we're doing Thursdays at 4 p.m. Central. If you're following along on the videos, they will get posted and you follow along at your own pace as the videos come up. Thanks. Have a great day.